Good morning, everyone. Good Mary. It's by God's blessing that uh, we are all permitted to be together this morning to remember his son and to encourage one another in our faith and fellowship. We are very pleased to see uh, our usual members within the Ecclesia and also uh, a number of out-of-town visitors. 
We're particularly uh, uh, happy to see uh, um, Sister Nancy and Brother Paul Sharp with us uh, in the face of all the difficulties that they uh, are currently experiencing on the West Coast. And we're very thankful to know that they are safe uh, this morning with us. We pray that continues. They have to, Jim. The fires. <clears throat> So we'll stop now at, and begin our service by uh, joining together in prayer. Our heaven. Thankful that we have this privilege to be together in love and fellowship to assemble as your fellow servants, to remember the great work and sacrifice of your son, our savior. And we arrive here this morning, each with our various difficulties and challenges in life. We know we are well blessed, but we face all the difficulties of human life and human weakness, and we are thankful to call upon thee as our God, who knows our every need and can help us each day to overcome the, the issues that we face. And so we thank you, O Lord, that we can come now and turn our attention to your word and focus specifically on the work of your son, Jesus, that we may see him as your son sent to be among us, to be among mankind, to show us how to live and to teach us the principles of godliness that will please thee and to help us to prepare for thy coming kingdom. So please be with us this morning May we lay aside all our daily concerns. May we bring our troubles to thee and ask for your help and comfort and guidance. The great promises you have made to change this world and to remove sin and suffering and to send your son to establish uh, that glorious kingdom you have promised. And so we come to thee now asking your blessing upon our meeting and upon each one of us who are here to uh, seek your love and to bring our uh, gratitude to thee. Through Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You gonna go full screen? Are you gonna, are you gonna go full screen? I'm going to ask a brother Chris Westwood now to lead us in reading Luke chapter five. Reading the Gospel record of Luke chapter five. So it was as the multitude pressed him to hear the word of God, and he stood by the lake to Nazareth. He saw two boats standing by the lake, and the fishermen were gone from them, and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put a little, put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for to catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. 
When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished that caught the fish which they had taken. And also there was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will be catchers of men. So when they had brought the boat to the land, they forsook all that followed him. They forsook all and followed him. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you will, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he had changed, and he charged him to tell no one, but to go and show yourself to the priests and make an offering for your cleansing. So the test has an testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went round concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came to hear and to be healed by him of their afflictions, their infirmities. So he himself Now it happened a certain day that he was teaching there. There were Pharisees and teachers of the Lord sitting by whom had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay him before lay him before him. And when he could not find how he might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up onto the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling onto, into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who can speak blasphemies, who can forgive sins, but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say unto you, arise. Take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Follow me. So he left all, rose up and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were many numbers of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and, the, and their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, Those are who are well have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers and likewise those of the Pharisees? But yours eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can you... Make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. 
then he spake a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match with the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and spill, and the wineskin be, be ruined. But new wine must be put into new, into new wineskins, and both will be preserved. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for it says, the old is better. Thank you, Brother Chris, for that reading. We're now very pleased to uh, welcome Brother Andrew Webb to the Ecclesia here this morning and to uh, invite him to bring us words of exhortation. Well, good morning, brethren and sisters. If you just put your thumb up, Ken, to say you can hear me. Great. We're in business. It's always a pleasure for Sister Donna and I to join the brethren and sisters from Toronto East. And I see we have particularly brethren and sisters from the Peterborough Ecclesia, which we've met with on many occasions as well. And so it's our pleasure, or my pleasure this morning, to bring you words of exhortation. It's now about six months late March since I was last called on to exhort for you and that was my first experience of speaking to you over Zoom and I assumed it would be the last one. How six months uh, changes things. But I bring to you then words of exhortation this morning to try and help us in our walk and as brother Ken was praying to us this morning he talked about the difficulties that we all face in life and I take that in a very broad term. And so this morning, we're actually going to look at how Christ protects and cares for us. And so by way of exhortation, then, I want to consider just one saying of Jesus. It's a saying that's intrigued and encouraged me for a long while, because it shows Jesus' compassion on Matthew and Luke. The context, at least in Matthew, is that Jesus has just delivered a series of woes condemning the Pharisees. And he concludes in Matthew 23 and 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. And here's the expression I'm interested in. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And at least on my screen, and I won't share it with you, of an absolutely wonderful picture I found of a big black and white um, hen with all sorts of little chickens underneath her. And, um, and that's the picture that I have. He says something similar in Luke, but the context isn't quite so clear. But Jesus declares here how he would cover and protect the people and charges the leaders, the Pharisees, in failing in their responsibility. Brother Harry Whittaker, in his uh, commentary on the gospel, states, The intense outburst of Jesus was blanketed by sadness as he contemplated this melancholy destiny of his people. To think as such a fate must come, up, come to this generation. To save them from being a prey to the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the Herods. But all in vain. They were snatched away by the Roman eagle. This dire fate must come upon them because although he would, they would not. this gospel in the Olivet prophecy he that's Jesus <coughs> assures them or assures us that he will surely gather the elect 
at his second coming. It's in Matthew 24 and 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And so we know this situation that Jesus saw um, at the hands of the Pharisees will not last. And so by way of exhortation, let us consider this concept of being protected by the wings of both the Father and the Son. And indeed, see how it looks forward to the kingdom itself. This analogy of being protected by wings, usually that of an eagle rather than of a chicken, is a common theme, particularly in the Old Testament. Christ is describing what has always been happening to the Jews and the Hebrews, but has now been lost. It's ironic that the eagle was a symbol of Rome, yet they did not ultimately provide any hope for the nation. The contrast then between the Father and the Son and with Rome could not be more marked. So let's turn back to the Old Testament, because that's where, for the most part, we're going to be today. And beginning to look at the Song of Moses, who on his deathbed, um, so in the Song of Moses, who was on his deathbed, the Lord is described as an eagle who protects Israel under his wings. And as we go through these three or four verses in chapter 32, uh, out for, it starts off talking about Jacob and then simply refers to him as him. And so I think we've got a picture of what God did for Jacob and subsequently carried through from the land. And so beginning to read it, Deuteronomy 32 and 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land. I think that's referring to Bethel. And in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. And so now he starts to draw the analogy of the eagle. As an eagle stirreth up her nest fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. And so we see how God, in the figure, the analogy of the eagle, protected Jacob as he began that journey of life that led to the establishment of the Hebrews in the land of Israel. Looking on to a much later example, consider the words of Boaz to Ruth. This is in Ruth 2 and 12. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given of thee, sorry, of thee, sorry, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And this, in fact, is Boaz speaking Ruth as having become under the care and indeed of the guardianship of the Lord God. But there's one word here that we also need to focus on. It's the idea of how we avail ourselves of this care and overshadowing by God. And it's the word trust. And we're going to see that come up constantly in the Psalms. Because I want us now to look at the words of the psalmists. And most of these, I think, are the words of David. And David himself would, of course, be very familiar with the example of Ruth. I think she was his great or great grandmother or something like that. So let's just go through half a dozen psalms that pick upon this idea. In Psalm 17 and 18, he says, keep me as the apple of the eye. And indeed, um, that's a pick up from Deuteronomy again. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. And so we here have a prayer of David as he appeals to God for protection from the wicked. 
in Psalm 36 and 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. And so David, as, as you look here, is actually comparing the wisdom of man to the perfect nature of God. And then in 57 and 1, David is speaking here, and it's clearly David. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Refuge until these calamities be overpassed. And the context here of this psalm is that David is, is hiding in the cave from Saul and he's appealing and seeking this protection and shadowing by God. And then moving on to 61 and 4. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert or the shelter of thy wings. And so David now offers a prayer for God's eternal protection. In 63 and 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. And so David declares how he thirsts after God and acknowledges how he has been cared for. And the last one. He shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. It's a psalm here describing God as our sanctuary and our refuge when we abide in him. We're covered by his feathers. We're under his wings. Uh, really uh, a double expression to exp that expresses the same idea. And so how the... The words of the psalmist sum up with what our own attitude should be. The key word, as we've suggested here, is trust. We can avail ourselves of being covered in the, by the wings of the Father in all circumstances of life if we only put our trust in him. And as we said, Brother Ken in his prayer reflected upon the difficulties of life and indeed some of the Isaiah sums up the idea of how that Israel, by an implication we, are under God's protection as he describes a renewed Israel. Um, and we're reading now from Isaiah 4, beginning at 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be the defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow, as a protection, that is, and in the daytime from the heat. And as a place of refuge for a covert or, um, from storm and rain. And so we see how the day is coming when a renewed Israel is going to find itself under the shadow of God. When a renewed Israel is going to find that God is a refuge from the storm and the rain. And so we see the protection of God in a renewed Israel. The prophet later uses a slightly different analogy when considering wings. It's actually in chapter 40 and 31. But they that wait With wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. And so now we've got a slightly different picture that the people, and it's looking forward, I believe, to us, 
will be given these same wings of eagles that we can, it says, run, not be weary, walk and not be faint. And so a slightly different analogy to what we've been looking at so far, but a picture of how we can run um, with God. It, of course, brings back that expression, it's difficult to solve with eagles when you uh, work with, and I think you know the rest of it. Um, but it's, it, it, it's true in this sense, is that um, expression, that when we live in a world full of sin and wickedness, it's very difficult to soar and live the life of Christ surrounded by sin and evil in which um, we exist. But here God's people are comforted because they are not under the control of the Roman eagle. Malachi, I think, brings this all together um, when he speaks of the son of righteousness bringing healing in his wings. It's in Malachi chapter 4 and 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. But what is this looking forward to? I think it's a picture of the future millennial reign of Christ, of Jesus Christ. The one described as the son of righteousness here can be no other than Jesus Christ himself. The Lord is... Read that together. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. And the coming of the Messiah is pictured as a sunrise in several passages. Um, Isaiah 60 and 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And Jesus is the light of the world in John 8 and 12 will be the son of that day. The sun can blister and burn as described in Malachi 4 and 1, the verse just before what we're considering. But it can also bless and its blessing effect is in view here. The fact that the son of righteousness arise with healing in its wings invokes a picture of wings of a bird stretched across the sky, offering healing to those below. A healing effect will infuse the earth during this time, removing the negative impact of past sins. And this, of course, is referring to, as we suggested, the millennial, the millennium. When Christ returns, God's righteousness and peace will flood the earth. And so we read in Isaiah 11 and 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in Habakkuk 2 and 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in Isaiah 61 and 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be... me with the garments of salvation and he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels and so here in malachi 4 and 2 god's people will see the son of righteousness himself rising over the world to cover it and the verse concludes with another word picture of calves released from a stall in which the glorified kingdom are likened to calves which have been fed, fattened, and kept in a small dark pen waiting to be slaughtered, who then suddenly break out into daylight and go prancing away through the meadows. This will be our leap of joy and taste of true freedom. And so we pray, brethren and sisters, for that day when the healing of Christ will finally spread his wings and cover all peoples with the righteousness in his kingdom. So as we now contemplate and think about the emblems upon the table, let us remember that we have indeed been called out from underneath the 
the wings of evil in this world, that we have been called out and we can avail ourselves of the wings of the eagle of God and the wings and the eagle of Christ, that we will be covered and that our sins in so doing will be covered. And so as we partake in a few moments of the bread and the wine, let us be thankful of what it is that we have. Let us be thankful that we remain in this life under the protection of our Heavenly Father. Let us be thankful that we've been called into covenant relationship with him. And indeed, we await and bring the earth to peace. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Andrew. I think we all have felt encouraged this morning by the uh, principles and uh, Bible passages that we've looked at and considered about the care and oversight of God in our lives, his interest in our welfare, and his desire that we trust in him in all our ways. So thank you for those uh, beautiful words this morning, which bring us now to the uh, breaking of bread um, and the taking of wine. We think of Jesus himself uh, assembled with his disciples in the upper room. And surely he must have thought about the principles that you've uh, presented to us this morning, uh, Brother Andrew, that the Lord himself trusted in God. It was perhaps the ultimate trust to, to have to face the difficulties which were before him and to um, relinquish his life in, in death in obedience to his father. And so he, he was a man of faith and trust and he was a man of love love of his father of his father's purposes and love of his disciples and followers so we think now of the situation in that upper room and i'm reading this morning from the gospel of luke And when the hour was come, Jesus sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of of God. Now those are amazing words, aren't they? When we think about uh, Jesus desiring to be in this situation, to have uh, a last meal, a last Passover meal with his disciples. But it was more than that. It was not only a remembrance of the past, it was a consideration of the future. And he says that he will do this again when it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So the Lord was looking in two directions. The strength of God in all of uh, his people's affairs in the past and in his promise to gather his people in the future. And Jesus, of course, knew that he would, he would be the uh, key person in that regathering. And he took the bread This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And so through the use of two 
of very common elements uh, in our daily life, bread and wine, the Lord introduces this very simple way in which we can remember him. And for many uh, in the service this morning, we have done this for years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in our life, trying faithfully each week to remember the Lord, to take a little piece of bread, to take a sip of wine, and to remember all that those symbols embrace, both past and future. So we'll now give thanks for the bread before we uh, take it and eat it. And Brother Dennis Dawes will lead us in that prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before thee to thank thee for this bread, which reminds us of thy son's willing sacrifice his trust in thee, in that he said, not my will, but thine be done. And so for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame and is now set down on thy right hand. And so help us to take up our cross and follow him for the joy that is set before us to on this earth and teach the nations of thee. And so we thank thee for his sacrifice and we thank thee for this bread and for this remembrance and seek thy continued blessing that we might follow him and walk worthy of our calling. So accept our thanks now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So now let us take the bread in our homes and take it as a remembrance of uh, the great important principle of the Lord uh, offering his body in obedience to God and for our salvation. Lord, introduced to us as the way in which to remember him. The first is bread, which represents his body. And the second is wine, which represents his blood. Both of these components are essential. Both teach us different aspects of our Lord's mission and purpose and sacrifice. And so we need to remember and take both of these symbols on a regular basis that we may be impressed in our mind and reminded <coughs> each week of the importance of his sacrifice and the need for us to keep this in our hearts and minds each day. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. 
And so highly meaningful, highly significant is this wine which represents the blood of our Lord. Brother Ken Eason will now lead us in giving thanks for this wine. Dear Lord God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We come before you, Father, to thank you for the wine, the symbol of your son's poured out life, his blood given on our behalf to cleanse us from our sins, but also a life lived of, as an example of your character. Through the healing of those in need, of the compassion he had upon the multitudes, of providing food for those who had come to hear him and had brought nothing. Dear Father, in our times of need, we realize that we can go to you through your Son, as we do now, to thank you and to praise you, and most importantly, to acknowledge that you are our God, and upon you we are utterly and totally dependent. And so, Father, we trust ourselves to your care. We commit ourselves to your protection and pray that you would help us to stay away from the lure of this world and its enticements. Help us, guide us, and keep us in the way of your Son. In his name we pray, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's now take the wine as a remembrance of the sacrifice of our Lord. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So we think of our exhortation this morning and the, the valuable reminder of God's care, God's invitation to find shelter and comfort and safety under his wings. And with the exhortation, we take the reminder we've just uh, taken in receiving bread and wine as the emblems of his death. So in these things, we should be helped and fortified for the, the issues and challenges of this coming week. We thank Brother Andrew again for his uh, very helpful talk. We'll now have our meditation hymn.
We'll now look at the announcements uh, for the coming week. Today we have uh, enjoyed the, the kind services of Brother Andrew Webb from the Kitchener-Waterloo Ecclesia. And we appreciate his words of encouragement and comfort. We thank Brother Ken Eason for making all the necessary arrangements for our uh, meeting here this morning uh, electronically. There are two collections which may be made by mail and the instructions that you have received in the past. The regular expenses of the Ecclesia continue on a monthly basis, so uh, please keep that in mind. And the second collection today is for Agape in Action. On Wednesday evening at 7.30, there will be a Bible class uh, online. Uh, I'm scheduled to preside and the uh, speaker is to be arranged. It's been necessary to make a change there. So uh, you'll be hearing um, prior to Wednesday night's class. Uh, next week, God willing, uh, to preside uh, Brother Dennis Dawes and to exhort Brother Phil Dwyer. The second collection next week is uh, Fairhaven House. The newsletter will list um, a number of important items, but we should just uh, always uh, keep in our mind the uh, members of the Ecclesia who have uh, needs um, and certainly need to be remembered in our thoughts and prayers. And Sister Robin Goodhue, Brother David Morell, Sister Iris Spence, Sister Jean Willoughby, and Sister Ruth Woodside. There are others, of course, who have uh, various issues and problems, and if you know of those, you should uh, include them as well in your prayers and in your thoughts. Cards, of course, are always welcome by those who are uh, perhaps shut in at home. This week, you all received the very uh, sad announcement of the passing of Sister Linda Wilton of the Manitoulin Island Ecclesia. Uh, many in the Ecclesia will have met her, certainly her husband, Brother Dan Wilton. And um, at age 44, she died of cancer this past week. The newsletter cont contains um, some detailed information about uh, Sister Linda and her life and the arrangements for an online funeral service this coming week. We mentioned the fires uh, in the states of California. That, that is very concerning. There are many of our members um, uh, in those West Coast states and uh, many ecclesias. And so uh, we watch the, the unfolding news of um, that situation with the fires and certainly the welfare of our brothers and sisters. And we pray they may be kept safe and if possible, their homes also be kept safe. I remind you of the appeal from the Toronto West Ecclesia about the need for accommodation for a brother uh, coming to Canada sometime in, in the next uh, six months or so where uh, temporary accommodation is needed. If anyone can help for a week or two weeks or a month, um, that would be a, a great assistance to the Toronto West Ecclesia. And you're asked to contact Brother Brian Carrick if uh, you are in a position to, to help. So those are the announcements uh, for the week. And we pray that God will be with each one of us in the, the various situations that I mentioned. We're going to have our closing hymn now, hymn 292, 
exalt, O God, thy glorious throne throughout the world, thy will be done. Hymn 292, and Brother Percy William will lead us in a concluding prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We humbly approach unto your throne of grace at the close of our meeting to thank you that we have been able to meet around your table. We pray that the words and thoughts are pleasing unto you. We pray that the words of exhortation from Brother Andrew will give us the strength and the faith to carry on your work. We sincerely hope, Lord, that we will be able to resist the temptations of the world around us. We pray for a blessing for those who are on sick beds, those who are in dire straits, and those who have fallen away from the truth. We pray for understanding and knowledge of the world events that are leading up to the return of your son Jesus to set up his kingdom. We pray that by partaking of these emblems, we'll be found worthy of a place in that glorious kingdom. We pray that we will be able to continue to meet around your table until that glorious day. We thank you that we are able to meet online, and we pray that you will... We thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We pray that we will use these blessings to your glorification. We ask all these things, and through your Son Jesus, amen. <laughs>